This was the second week that we're doing the Rock Pound Workshop, and we're doing sedimentary rocks. Okay, so before we get started talking about sedimentary rocks, we're going to talk about erosion. Erosion is, it's pretty simple. It's basically where rocks or soil are broken and moved. Those two things, broken and moved. Um, erosion is kind of the creation of sedimentary rocks. So we're going to talk about wind erosion and then different types of water erosion. Rain erosion, ice, water, um, all different types of water. So the first thing we're going to talk about is wind erosion. So wind is where the wind actually picks up and moves particles of rocks or soil and drags them from one place to another. A lot of different processes happen when, when that goes on. It's separating out different sizes sometimes of, of rocks because it can only move dust or little sand pieces. Usually can't move a giant boulder, right? Um, and as it's doing that, it sometimes scratches across other rocks. So it can form these canyons, like this is, um, I think Z Bryce, I think this is Bryce Canyon. Um, and it's got these streaks in it that are worn down from sand being just blown across it for tens of thousands of years. You've all heard of sandstorms that happen in the desert, thankfully more common let's say in Africa than it is here in the United States, but it does happen. There's dunes, right? So we know that the sand, the, the wind can move the sand up and over, and these dunes actually travel with time. If you look at maps from 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, where these, the locations of these sand dunes were has changed because each little grain of sand gets picked up and moved. Um, sometimes the wind creates some really crazy shapes with rocks. It can blow holes right through things by wearing it down with sand. So wind erosion is one type of erosion. Pretty much the rest of them that we're going to talk about have to do with water. We're going to talk about rain. We're going to talk about the effects of frost wedging, which is like ice. Glaciers, what glaciers do. Flowing water and coastal wave erosion. So the first one we're going to talk about is rain, the effects of rain. So everybody has probably seen something like this, right? After it rains, if you look down in, in puddles or where that puddle was, you'll see these little raindrops or where a raindrop hit, these little depressions. Each time a, the force of just one drop of rain comes down, it actually wears away and moves a little bit of rock or clay or sand, and it over time, enough time can lead, can add up to some significant erosion. So it can wear down and move some material to a new location. Another one is called frost wedging. It's kind of a complicated name, but it's something that I think you'll understand pretty easily. Does anybody know what's going on in this picture in the top corner up here? What's going on there? All right, that's that's okay. Um, can somebody else help? What do you think? Yeah. One more guess. Water expands. So when the Pepsi froze, it exploded. When the Pepsi froze, it exploded. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. He said water expands when it freezes. So when this Pepsi it froze, the can exploded. So when water <coughs> turns from liquid water into ice, it actually gains 9% in volume. So it gets bigger when it freezes. So what happens in the real world is when water seeps into cracks and then it freezes, it splits those cracks apart. So the picture, let's see, this picture right here, can somebody tell me what that is a picture of? What is it? Looks like our roads, right? Yeah, I took the picture right out on the road out here. Not really. Um, but it's potholes. So frost wedging is what forms potholes. Water gets in the cracks and the asphalt and the cement and as it freezes it splits and cracks and makes potholes. So that's something that everyone has seen. 
This happens everywhere. It doesn't happen just on our roads or with our, you know, Pepsi cans. It happens on rocks. So water gets in these cracks, expands, and can break, break the rocks. As crazy as it sounds, just that can break the rocks and crumble them. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay. All right, the next type of erosion we're going to talk about is the action of glaciers. Glaciers did some really cool things. And in Michigan, we actually can see a lot of them. We had glaciers here. Um, so what glaciers do, well, first, what is a glacier? Does everybody know what a glacier is? Somebody tell me. What's a glacier? A big ice sheet. That's a really good answer, right? So glaciers were these, and still are, these big pieces of ice. And they actually kind of flow a little bit. As crazy as it sounds, they move and they flow just a little bit with gravity. And as they push downhill, they pick up rocks at, at the bottom on the ground underneath the ice and they drag them along. So in, in their process where they're flowing, they're breaking up rocks, they're rounding the rocks out, and they're moving them to a new location. Also, these rocks, as they're being pulled along, it scrapes the bedrock, the rock that's at the bottom of the ground, which actually this is a picture of bedrock that was scraped by the glaciers. Um, you can see these indentations in it that are in these lines, and that's the direction of flow of the glacier. If you ever go to Cranbrook in the basement, they have a piece of bedrock that they cut out that's just like this. It's really cool. And you can imagine where these boulders were that just scraped these big lines into the bedrock. It's really cool. Um, so glaciers pull, they deposit, they move a lot of rock. And we had glaciers here in Michigan. Right where we're standing, there used to be one mile of ice standing on top of the ground um, only 10, 15,000 years ago. So it's, it's crazy, but we can see, particularly around Jackson and in lower mid-Michigan, there's a lot of glacier landforms that you can see. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that glaciers do. The next type of erosion we're going to look at is flowing water. So this one makes a lot of sense. I think this is what most people think of when they think of erosion. This is like what rivers do. So we all know that rivers can cut canyons, right? The Grand Canyon, all the other canyons. We see that the water, as the water is pulling all these rocks, it's grinding away the bedrock. Um, and that's something that's, that's pretty, pretty normal. We can think of the waterfalls that we see, or even just tiny little rills, they call them, when you see a fresh pile of dirt. You'll see after it rains, it washes out these little things that look like little tiny rivers, right? So flowing water can pull water down. Another thing it can do is sort the material. So when I say sort, I'm particularly talking about the size of the material. Have you ever noticed when you go swimming in the lake sometimes, you'll find an area where it's all really nice sand, and then you'll swim over here and you'll find an area where there's lots of big rocks or sharp rocks? It's because of the, the force of the water. The water has sorted out and put the sand over here and the pebbles over here and the boulders over here. Rivers do that. Lakes do that. Pretty much any type of water can sort materials. So the last one we're going to talk about is coastal wave erosion. So that's each wave that kind of hits the ground, hits the shoreline, is actually moving and grinding away material. So it's rounding out pebbles. It could be cutting away at, you know, the, at a cliff. This person didn't build their house in a very good spot, did they? Um, this is in the UP, actually. This is gorgeous. Um, you can see this, this whole cliff is all worn away from action of the waves. Um, so every wave basically pushes and grinds away material. And it can also sort material. So that's erosion. Erosion is that breaking and moving of rocks. How do we get from erosion to sedimentary rocks? We get those broken and those moved rocks and get them stuck together somehow. That's how we have to go from that material to a sedimentary rock. 
So the fancy word we use for that is compaction and lithification. Lithification means to turn into a rock. Um, so we're going to talk about some different properties of sedimentary rocks. Just like last week with the igneous rocks, we talked about phaneritic and vesicles and all those other cool terms. We're going to talk about some different terms that we use for sedimentary rocks. We're going to talk about what they're made out of. Okay, so that's the clastic, bioclastic, biochemical, and chemical. Then we're going to talk about what they look like and how they're put together. So the grain size, whether the grains are sorted or not, how they were stuck together, the cementation, and whether they're fissile or not, how they break. So the first thing, this slide shows a lot of information. Most sedimentary rocks, what you think about is these, these clastic rocks. A clast is like a, a piece of something. So clastic means it's a bunch of pieces together. Um, so clastic rocks are made of little pieces of rocks or minerals, other rocks or minerals, that are stuck together. Pretty simple. Can somebody tell me one of the, the rocks that I asked you to pull out that you think might be clastic? Yes. Conglomerate. That's an excellent example, right? So conglomerate. You look at your piece of conglomerate and you see these little pebbles, these little clasts that are all stuck together. The next one that we're going to talk about is bioclastic. So what does the, the prefix bio, this first little part, bio, mean? What does that represent? Life. That's, that's a good word. So anything that was living, is living, was living, had something to do with life. That's what that bio word means. So bioclastic means that there's particles stuck together and some of them had something to do with life. They were once alive. They were organic, right? Um, can somebody tell me a piece that might be bioclastic in your kit? Yeah. Anthracite? Anthracite? Eh, not exactly. Yeah. Fossil limestone. That's the one I was looking for, okay? So that limestone with fossils is a really good example of bioclastic. Okay, the other end of the spectrum is chemical sedimentary rocks. Chemical. So chemical sedimentary rocks means they're made of little crystals that were deposited from a solution. So instead of being made of pebbles and parts and pieces that were stuck together, Chemical rocks are from a solution. I don't know that there's any in your kit that are specifically chemical. Some examples I can give you are some minerals that you have in your kit, actually. Halite and gypsum are often also considered chemical sedimentary rocks, depending on how they formed. Um, so halite and gypsum are two common chemical sedimentary rocks. Now, another one that we have is biochemical rocks. So it's kind of like chemical rocks, except it's got something that was living in it. Um, but not so much made out of pieces and parts that when you look at it, you could see a little shell or see something that was living. It's more crystalline. Um, maybe crystalline. Can somebody tell me one in your kit that we might consider biochemical, more or less? Yeah. Shale. Um, Sometimes. That's, I'll give you sometimes on that one. Another one. Coal. That was actually the one I was looking for. So coal isn't, isn't truly crystalline, but we would call it a biochemical rock because it's made of lots of biological material. Does everybody understand these four ways of breaking down sedimentary rocks? You know, I, it's, Sort of could be. Honestly, it, it could kind of fall in either one. But there's not actual physical pieces that you're going to see in the coal. Um, it's more of a, it's more plastic, actually. Okay, so next we're going to talk about grains. So grains are those little clasts, the pieces um, that, the, that sedimentary rocks are made out of, clastic sedimentary rocks specifically. So the grains could range in size from anything, right? From huge down to tiny. So can somebody tell me which one of those sedimentary rocks that you have looks like it has the largest grain size? Which one? Conglomerate. 
I'll bet. Conglomerate should have pretty big grains, maybe the size of your fingernail. Certainly might, right? Can somebody tell me which one looks like it has the smallest grains in it? Which one? Sandstone. That's a good guess because the grains look much smaller than in the conglomerate. But I've got a, there's another one in there that has even smaller grains. You might not even, you can't see them with your naked eye, I should say. Anthracite. Yes, but I, it's not, not so clastic. It's, I'm looking for a rock that's definitely made of little particles. What do you think? I can't hear you. Is clay one of those samples in the kit? But it's actually made out of clay. The sample I'm asking about. Yeah. Limestone. The one I'm looking for is shale, okay? Shale is made out of very tiny, tiny pieces. They're actually between silt and clay. So that's the sizes of, of samples. So the biggest in our kit is going to be conglomerate. The smallest is going to be shale. In the middle falls sandstone, because they're definitely smaller than in the conglomerate, but you can still see them if you look really close. In the shale, you need a microscope to see how tiny those little pieces are, right? So the other thing we're going to talk about with the grains is how well they're sorted. So I have a question. In your sample of sandstone, would you say that the grains are well sorted, like they're the same size approximately? Yes or no? Yes, okay, so all the grains look about the same size in sandstone, so it's a well-sorted rock. Same with shale. You usually don't see a pebble stuck in the middle of shale. It's almost always smooth, so it's well-sorted also. What about your conglomerate? Would you say that each piece is almost exactly the same size? No, no. Sometimes there's real big pieces in there, Sometimes there's medium ones, sometimes there's tiny ones, sometimes there's some that are like sand. And under a microscope, you'll actually see particles that are tiny, silt sized, like the ones in, in shale. So conglomerate is poorly sorted. So when they all match, we call it well sorted, and when they don't match, we call it poorly sorted. Does that make sense? Anybody have questions about grain size or grain sorting? Yes. You can see what in your shale? You think you can see the particles in your shale? Maybe. Usually you need a microscope to see them. The shale is usually very fine grain, but you might be able to see some particles in there. Okay, so next we're going to talk about how they're stuck together. Okay, so we call that the cementation. What's the first part of that big word sound like? Cement, right? Cement. So cement is actually a mixture of rocks and mortar or cement that sticks it all together. That's what we make roads out of and buildings and other things. But the same thing happens with these sedimentary rocks, where the bigger rocks get stuck together into littler rocks. So most of the time, there is a, a fluid or a liquid that has some dissolved minerals in it that sticks the rocks together. A lot of times that's like a calcite or a quartz or a feldspar. Sometimes, particularly in the case of sandstone, it's just the pressure that actually bonds them together. They almost weld together and get stuck from so much pressure. Um, so those are kind of the two different ways that samples can get stuck together. The next thing we're going to talk about is a property that these sedimentary rocks have. It's called fissile, whether or not it's fissile. Um, fissile means that it'll break into a flat piece. Can somebody tell me which sample looks like it breaks into flat sheets the best out of all the ones in your kit? Which one? Shale, absolutely. Shale is very fissile, right? It breaks into these gorgeous sheets, really flat, in fact, that's the best way to identify shale is because it breaks into those flat sheets. Um, these other ones, the other samples in the kit, it actually depends on the sample. Sometimes they can be fissile a little bit. Sometimes, like this is sandstone here, 
And you can see it's breaking into some layers, but not nearly as nice as shale does. And you would need to actually look at the big boulder or the big plate of the rocks to see that it's not breaking, or that it does break into some sheets. If you just had a small piece, you might not even realize that it was broken into some sheets. And then there's some rocks that are almost never fissile. Um, actually, I guess... All of them could be almost with the no. They could almost all be fissile, or could almost all be fissile. But sometimes they are not fissile. So you have to look at the sample and determine if you can see those flat lines that it breaks onto. Do you have a question? No, that's silly. All right, so the sedimentary rocks that we're dealing with are sandstone, limestone fossil, we used to call it limestone shell, shale, conglomerate, and bituminous coal. Now I asked you to bring out that extra one, anthracite, because we're going to talk about it today with the other coals. So the first one we're going to talk about is sandstone. So grab your sample of sandstone. It's 14B. Can somebody tell me what color your sandstone is? What color is yours? Light brown. Can somebody tell me if theirs is not light brown, what color is it? What color? A tannish yellowish. Okay, how about yours? Beigeish. Okay, how about yours? Grayish. Okay, so all of those are pretty earthy colors, right? Tannish, brownish, beigeish, yellowish. Um, but it doesn't have to be, right? It doesn't have to be. Um, sandstone can be almost any color. Does anybody see that it broke onto a flat face? Like, is there a, a flat spot where it might have broke that it would be somewhat fissile? If, if your sample does, raise your hand. Okay, so see some of you. Some of you, some maybe not. So it's really difficult to tell in a small piece whether it broke on the flat planes or not. Um, sandstone can actually be made out of a number of different minerals, but for the most part, we're going to focus on the mineral quartz. Most of the time, sandstone is made out of quartz grains. Um, quartz is very weather resistant, and it's very common. So there's lots of areas that have almost all quartz grains of sand, which makes it easy for that sandstone to form. Okay, so sandstone can actually form in both a wet or a dry environment, which makes sense, right? Because we see sand at the beach in a wet environment, and we see sand in the desert in a dry environment. And I don't really expect you to remember this, but the way that the lines inside the sandstone, the, the grains, when you look at the big picture, the way that they are laid together, you can tell whether or not it was wet or dry. We call it cross-cutting when it's dry. If you look in this picture here, you can see that there's lines that go up on an angle and then other ones that meet it at, a, at the opposite angle. That's from a dune, the same way that the, the sand would be pushed over the top of the dune and then fall on the bottom. So that came from a dry environment. In general, in the wet environments, we'll see layers that are just laid down flat. Not always, but for the most part. So what do we do with sandstone? We use it for building stones sometimes. We use it for abrasives. This picture was taken maybe 40 or 50 years ago in um, Grindstone City. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's up by Port Austin and Bad Axe in the tip of the thumb. And they have this deposit of sandstone where the grains are all very sharp. When you look at them under a microscope, the grains of sand, instead of being rounded like they usually are, they're really rough. So they used to make these giant grinding stones that they would use in manufacturing. We don't make them out of natural stone anymore. Now we have composites that we use. If you go to Home Depot, they're, they're man-made stones. But back a hundred years ago, they used to make these out of the natural stone. And what you're looking at here in this picture is on the beach. They used to stack them up on boats 
And when the boats would get caught in storms, they would the top ones would sometimes fall off of the stack, and then they'd wash up on shore. Um, most of these aren't here anymore. They've all been picked up, and they're used as decoration in people's yards. Um, so if you drive around Grindstone City, you'll see flower beds and things, driveway markers made out of grindstones that people collected. Um, but sandstone can sometimes have fossils, not always, but occasionally you'll see a fossil shell or other fossils. It's not the best because the grains are pretty big. So it's not the best for preserving fossils, but sometimes it does. Sometimes you'll see stuff. Does anybody have questions about sandstone? Yes. Yes. Nope, they use the grindstones to grind down metal usually. It did wear it down extremely fast, which is why they made tons of them. So it did wear it down a lot. Let me show you some pieces of sandstone. This piece is actually from Grindstone City. And if you feel it, it's a little bit rough. It's a gray color, almost clay colored, grayish brown. And it's rounded because I found it on the beach. This one's a little bit more yellowish, which the color of sandstone is often from other minerals that leached into the, um, into the sand at some point. There's what they call red beds, which are from water. There was always water with these red beds, and they color the sandstone into a really bright reddish color. This one here is pretty neat. It's got little bits of layers of iron inside of it. So these layers here are actually iron-rich material. And that's what colored this in different tones of reds and browns. It's a pretty cool piece. Okay, next we're going to talk about limestone. Now the kit, the one in your kit is fossil limestone, which means that there's almost always fossils in it, or there should be a fossil in it. Um, I do want you to really understand that limestone, there's a ton of different types of limestone. If you compete in Science Olympiad in junior high or middle school and high school, I think there's six or seven different types of limestone that you're going to ask, ask to, to be learn, you know, to learn about. So I want you, I want to try and expose you to some of the other ones, but we're going to focus on the, the fossil limestone. So for the most part, fossil limestone is made of shells, shells from ocean life, almost always. There can be other fossils in it as well, but it's usually shells. Now, I wrote here that it will react with acid. That's something we're going to talk more about when we talk about minerals. But what that means is if you put hydrochloric acid or some other acid on top of limestone, it will bubble, okay? So that's an identification tool that scientists sometimes use. They'll put a little drop of acid, and if it bubbles, they know it's got carbonates in it, and it could be limestone, okay? So what do we do with fossil limestone? Well, we make stuff out of it. There's buildings. This is a distillery, I think, in Tennessee, made out of limestone. Um, the Sphinx is actually made out of a type of nummulitic limestone, which is, nummulites are a type of fossil. And pretty much all of the, the pyramids in the Sphinx are made out of this particular, I'm sorry, sandstone. Limestone, limestone, made out of this type of limestone. Yes, you have a question. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that there was actually both in the kit. So limestone shell will just have shells. Limestone fossil could be any other type of fossil. Thank you for bringing that up to me. So also we make countertops a lot of times. If you ever look, some countertops will have little tiny shells inside of them, and those are limestone 
Those are little shell, fossil shells inside limestone. When I was a kid, my house growing up, the little window sills, there were teeny tiny shells in it, and that was fossil shell limestone. Let me show you a few pieces of limestone that I brought. This sample has some little tiny shells in it, if you look very close, but mostly it's just a medium gray. You have to look really close to see the shells. This one's made almost entirely of shells. If you look at it up close, it's pretty much just shells packed together. There's a couple other fossils, there's a couple crinoids and other weird things that used to live back then, but it's largely shells. This is a piece of fossil coral. So I found that on the beach, and um, I think it's, I'm not sure what type of coral it is, but it's a type of fossil coral. Does anyone else know of a type of fossil coral that we sometimes find here in Michigan? What is it? Petoskey stone, that's right. So our state stone is Petoskey stone, and that's a type of fossil limestone. Petoskey stones are made out of limestone, and they're a fossil coral. This is a different type of coral, but also fossil than fossil limestone. Now this one is not, this one doesn't have any fossils in it. This is actually a piece of a stalactite. So on the end of it, you can see there's rings. So this came from a cave. It was hanging down the roof of the cave. And it's actually more crystalline. There's little tiny crystals in there. So no, no actual shells or fossils in this piece. But it's also a sample of limestone. The type of limestone we, is, that this is is travertine. You don't need to know that. But it's another type of limestone. Does anybody have any questions about shell or fossil limestone? Yes. It could. You had, he asked if fossil limestone could have purple or black crystals. Limestone, there's lots of m fluids carrying minerals that have flowed through it. And these fluids sometimes leave crystal pockets of other minerals. So the, lime, the crystals that you see wouldn't be limestone crystals, probably. Um, what they could be is fluorite or calcite or some other mineral. It's not too uncommon to find little crystal pockets inside limestone. Yeah. Limestone's not, not really created by rivers. No, limestone is usually created in the ocean. That's why we usually find ocean fossils in it. Yeah. I'm sorry, can it sometimes what? Make cement. That's an excellent question. Can limestone make cement? Absolutely. Absolutely. They put limestone in pretty much all cement. Most of the time, most limestone quarries sell cement. That's one of their biggest products that they sell. So it's an ingredient in cement. Yes. Very good. What else? Go ahead. How many types of limestone are there? I have no idea. There's a lot of them, though. There's a lot. In fact, with all types of rocks, Geologists have really broken it down into a very exact science. You know, if there's something that's halfway in between this and this, they give that rock a name. And then when they find a rock that's kind of halfway between this one and this one, they give that one a new name. And there are just thousands and thousands of types of rocks. And we're pretty much just going to use the basic names, the easy ones, because there's so many different names that you can't even count them. They come out with new ones all the time. Yeah. How do fossils form? Well, fossils form when something that was alive gets buried pretty quickly before it has a chance to rot away or break up into pieces. And it gets buried quickly, and then eventually what it got buried by turns into a rock. That's the, the quickest way I can say it. So something living gets buried and preserved before it rots or falls apart. Yeah. 
Why is the word lime in it? Lime is, actually has something to do with carbonates. Well, I think it might be Greek or Latin, I don't know. But that carbonate that reacts with acid, that's the root of that word lime. Okay, we're going to move on to shale. So shale, grab your sample 15B. Can somebody tell me what color their sample of shale is? What color? Gray. Can somebody tell me if theirs is not gray, what color it is? Blackish, that's a good answer. What about yours? Dark, dark gray, how about yours? Blackish, anybody have anything that I didn't say? Back, way back there. Black and brown, okay. So shale most often is either a dark gray or a black. That's, you know, most of the time when you find shale, it's gonna be those colors. Not always though. As you can see up in the top, sometimes it has a reddish tint, sometimes it grayish or yellowish. It depends on the minerals that are in it. But the best way to identify shale is that it always breaks into these flat pieces. What's the word that we use for that? Thistle, that's right. So it always breaks into these flat pieces. And the grains are very small. You usually can't see them with your naked eye. You need usually a microscope, not even a magnifying glass, to see the grains. It's rare when you can see the actual grains in them. So it forms in pretty deep ocean, or at least medium, you know, moderately deep ocean. Um, the limestone can sometimes form in shallower ocean, but shale forms in pretty deep ocean because it has to, the waves have to be able to carry those very fine particles out into the ocean without them dropping by the, by the shore in order for them to fall down in the ocean, down to the bottom. So there's a picture here. This is actually from the um, University of Michigan Field Museum. This is a, like a diorama that they have set up there of Devonian, Michigan. So back in the Devonian, that's a long time ago, I don't know how many thousands of years, um, there was a lot of shale and limestone being formed here in Michigan. This was a, a reef, and you can find trilobites and brachiopods and lots of cool fossils around here from the Devonian, some of which would be in shale. So what do we do with shale? I would say the most profitable thing in shale is fracking up here. Has anybody heard of fracking before? What is fracking? What are, what are we doing? Yeah. Excellent answer. She said it gets natural gases out from underneath the ground. That's exactly right. So just like we pump, we pump natural gas and we dig oil out of the ground, those are very valuable fossil fuels is the term that we use for those. Um, and up until about 15 or 20 years ago, we had no way of getting these natural gases out of these certain types of shale with lots of oil in them until somebody figured out that they could drill down and then turn the drill sideways and drill along parallel to the ground, drill horizontally into these shale layers, and then they set off dynamite, they explode underground explode around this shale, and those cracks release the gases. Um, there's more, more things to that. Um, some people are pretty against it because they put some bad or supposedly bad fluids down into the thing and which could get into the groundwater. Some people are concerned about that. I honestly don't know enough about it to tell you whether it's bad or not. It's my understanding that they do it significantly below the groundwater but I'm not 100% sure. Ron, you have something you want to share? All right, so a couple other things that we do with shale. One is we make bricks. Shale is actually basically clay. It's made out of clay particles. So if they grind it back up, it, it kind of becomes like clay again. So clay, we all know that clay can makes pottery and ceramics if we fire it, right? So they grind up shale sometimes and turn it into bricks. A lot of house bricks that they build houses out of are made of ground up shale. I also want to say that shale preserves some gorgeous fossils. This is a trilobite. This one's from Sylvania, Ohio. Um, it's beautiful. There's gorgeous, gorgeous fossils that come out of shale from Ohio and lots of other places. This one here is a Tully monster. Um, 
it's it's a crazy thing from Canada, actually. Um, but shale does an excellent job of preserving fossils. Let me show you a couple of samples of shale that I brought. So this one is pretty dark. It's pretty flat. You can see it broke into a thin piece. And it's a dark brown color. This one is a dark gray. This, I would say, is the most common color for most pieces of shale that you find. And it has two small trilobites. This one's from Utah. And this one is red, or reddish color. It's got a pretty flat surface here. You can see it broke into a couple other flat pieces. And on the bottom, it's got a fossil leaf. Shale and slate, we're going to talk about slate, the metamorphic version, um, look very similar. They're difficult to tell apart. Um, but one thing that I can say is if you see a fossil in it, you can pretty much guarantee that it's shale. When it gets the heat and pressure that it takes to turn into slate, it pretty much erases the fossils. So if you do see a fossil and it's in that very smooth, flat sheets, you can know that it's shale. Do you have a question? How good would the fossil be preserved if it was in a metamorphic rock? You wouldn't really see it. The heat and the, the pressure from the metamorphism generally erases the fossil, so it wouldn't be preserved well at all. The layers are formed, I think, mostly because they, they were yeah, settled down in layers. They were originally formed in layers. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is conglomerates. So everybody grab 12B. For the most part, when we think about conglomerate, we think about little pebbles stuck together. Would you say that your sample looks like small pebbles stuck together? Probably, right? Um, I have a question. In your sample, are the pebbles all the same size or do they vary in size? Yeah. No what? They don't vary in size or they do? They do vary in size. They're not the same. So it's poorly sorted, we could say. I have another question. Are all the pebbles the same color? Like they're either the same rock or mineral, or are they different? Like maybe they were different types of rocks and minerals. Yeah, they're different. Um, so those things are not true 100% of the time, but they're usually true and they're worth noting. So they're often from different materials, and they're often poorly sorted. So not always, but the way that they look tell us about how they form. So if the pebbles were rounded, we know that probably came from a beach or a river, probably, maybe a glacier deposit, something to do with water, something that was able to tumble and round those little pebbles into pieces. And whether they were sorted or not, or what size they are, might tell us if it was a fast-flowing river, or a little stream, or a beach. So we can kind of get clues to what it was like back when it formed based on what they are, you know, based on what those pebbles look like and how it looks. There's another type of conglomerate. It's not in your kit. It's called brescia. And brescia is, instead of being rounded pebbles, it's sharp pieces. So what that tells us, when those pieces are sharp, it means that the rocks got stuck together pretty quickly after they got broken. They didn't have a chance to tumble down a river and round themselves out. Um, they broke and then they got stuck together. So oftentimes that happens in a landslide or an earthquake or some other event that happens pretty quickly that breaks rocks and moves them and then they stick back together. Yes? 
We're not going to talk about fracking. You can ask Ron after class, okay? Um, so sometimes brushes are made out of, out of materials that are not very weather resistant. So it could be made out of feldspar or other things that break down pretty easily and wouldn't usually get tumbled in a river. So oftentimes conglomerate is made out of quartz, which is very weather resistant. Many of the pebbles, not always, but brushes sometimes are made out of things, even limestone and other things that weather pretty quickly. You have a question? It could be shale, yeah, it could be made out of pieces of almost anything. Um, it, it really just depends. And again, that's kind of where looking at what the rock is made out of tells us about where it formed and how it formed. If it was made out of pieces of shale, which is not very strong, you know that it got broken apart and then glued together pretty quickly. All right, we're going to talk briefly about another thing. It's, it's in your pamphlet along the lines of the sedimentary rocks. And it's actually a metamorphic rock. It's metaconglomerate. So this material is called pudding stone. So pudding stone is a type of conglomerate that had heat and pressure exposed to it that made it more like a metamorphic rock. Um, we find them in Michigan. They actually were formed mostly in the UP, um, or actually mostly in Canada out of sometimes pieces of jasper, which makes for really pretty samples. Um, and the glaciers brought them down and deposited them here in Michigan and Ohio, Indiana. Um, so let me show you some pieces of conglomerate brushia and pudding stone that I brought. Here's a piece of conglomerate that looks a lot like cement. In fact, you'd have to look at it really close to tell that it's not cement. The way that the it was cemented together actually isn't the same as cement. It's actually little pieces of sand and other things stuck together. But it's made of pebbles. All different colors. Some are black, some are white, some are brown. This one is a brescia, which a brescia is a type of conglomerate. So I want you to know that it's a subcategory of conglomerate. If you look real close, the pieces are more angular. They have sharp edges, sharp corners. They're not rounded. And this is a pudding stone. These red pieces are jasper. And the white actually used to be like a sandstone. It's almost like a quartzite now. But we call it a pudding stone or a metaconglomerate. You got a question? You got to speak louder for me. Can stones get stuck on what? Can stones get stuck on stones? On shells. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can get shells sometimes in conglomerate. Absolutely. Any other questions about conglomerate? Okay, next we're going to talk about coal. So grab out 11B and that sample 1 out of your egg crate. So coal is made from decaying organic matter. What does organic mean? What does that word mean? Yeah. Natural. Okay, even more descriptive. Can somebody give me a more descriptive word than natural? Yeah. Living. Living. That's the, that's the key word that I was looking for. So coal is made from decaying organic matter, stuff that used to be living. The younger forms, which we're going to talk about the progression of coal, often break into layers. The more heat, the more pressure, the more age it gets, the less that it breaks into those flat layers. It's a valuable resource, right? It's a fossil fuel. We burn it as fuel. Okay, so this is sort of the progression, or can be the progression of coal. It starts out as peat which is basically just like broken pieces of wood and leaves. You might find peat in a swamp or a bog if you went today and, and looked around on the ground. It's just dirt, almost looks like dirt, but peat might have pieces of wood, leaves, other things in it if you look close. 
Now, as that gets pressed down, the first form, that youngest form of coal, we call lignite, which is usually a brown color still, because it's like the dirt was. But it starts to break into layers and be a little bit more like a rock. It has more compression. It, it was pressed down. The next step we call subbituminous. Sub means almost or not quite. So it's not quite bituminous, but it's got more, it's experienced more pressure than the lignite has. The next step is bituminous. So that's your sample 11B. So what color is your sample 11B? What color? Black. Does anybody have one that's not black? What color? Silver. Okay. What color? A tiny speck of brown. That's a good observation. So 95% of the time, it's going to be black. Sometimes it'll have a little bit of brown swirled in. Might have a little bit of gray streaks or gray lines. Another observation? White. Maybe a little, a little bit of white though, right? The whole thing? You'll have to show me that after. Um, so it's almost always going to be black. That's what you want to look for. So with more heat and more pressure, more compaction, this original peat becomes these different types of coal. You put more pressure on it, it becomes anthracite coal. So that's the one out of your egg carton. Can somebody tell me a difference that you see when you look at your sample of bituminous and your sample of anthracite? A characteristic that's different between the two of them. Yeah. Anthracite is more shiny. That's a really good one. Okay, so the anthracite, it's hard to describe, but as you're looking at it, you'll probably see it. It's more shiny a little bit. What else? The anthracite is a little bit harder to break. That's probably true. That's probably true. What else? It looks kind of like obsidian. Now that is a really good observation. It sometimes breaks with those conchoidal fractures like obsidian does, or it looks like a conchoidal fracture. If you need to identify between the two of them, what I want you to do is feel the heft of them. Obsidian is much heavier than anthracite, so take note of that. But it does look like obsidian. Does anybody have any other observations between the two? That's just your sample. That's the shape of them. Um, one more. Your anthracite has a little more gray. It all depends. But anthracite is almost always a pretty dark black, too. Now, in the right conditions, theoretically, if you put enough pressure onto anthracite coal, graphite can form, which is another rock or mineral, depending on how you look at it. Um, and that's almost pure carbon. It doesn't really happen very often in nature, but it is theoretically possible. So I want to bring that to light as well. So what do we do with coal? We burn it, right? We burn it for power. Electricity is, is I would say, the biggest use for coal. We have these steam plants that they, the coal heats up water, which spins turbines, which makes electricity. We also use it for smelting different metals. We use it to heat up iron ore, to melt the iron out. Um, we use it for other types of heat. Any heat source we could use with coal. There are some people who still heat their homes with coal. I remember my grandma told me a story that she used to have to collect coal on the railroad tracks to heat her house with back in Pennsylvania. There was a lot of coal mining around there. Um, so they would heat their home with coal. Um, let me show you a few pieces of coal that I brought. All right, this sample is brown. It's a, definitely a dark brown, and it's pretty soft. You can flake pieces off with your fingernail pretty easily. What type of coal do you think that is, of the ones that I was showing you? Does anybody remember? Yeah. Go ahead. Nope. Anybody have another guess? Nope. It's not one on your list. Yeah. 
Go ahead. You know L1, the L1, you're right. It's lignite, okay? So this is that compressed peat. If you look at it, it, it almost looks like just pushed together dirt, because it kind of is. It's organic matter, but it's very soft. Would you say it's fissile? Does it look like it breaks into layers? I'd say so. So the next one, bituminous, this is in your kit. This sample, it's shiny in some spots and it's dull in others. If you take a look at it, it's got layers in it. It breaks into these pretty flat layers. Occasionally you'll find fossils inside coal. This one doesn't have any that you can see, but they do happen. Then this one is anthracite. It does almost look silvery. It, it kind of has a bit of a metallic luster. It's more shiny a little bit. You can still barely see the layers in it, and it breaks kind of a little bit more curved, a little more irregular. Now, I have a question. If you took the same size piece of each of these three and burned them, which one do you think would put out the most heat? Which one? Nope, exact same. If you cut exactly the same size piece, you measured it, made it exactly the same, which one? Anthracite, that's exactly right, because there's more organic matter compressed into that space. So more stuff got squished into a smaller space. So the anthracite has more energy contained in it than the bituminous or the lignite. Does anybody have any questions about coal? Yeah. Is charcoal considered a type of rock? Charcoal, they actually make it by burning wood, pieces of wood, in without, without oxygen, I think. They heat it up super hot and sort of burn it without oxygen. So it's not a rock. It's something that's more man-made, the charcoal briquettes. Yeah. If you put lots of pressure on coal, would it turn into a diamond? In theory, if you could get everything just right, maybe, because coal is carbon, right? And graphite that we talked about is pure carbon, and diamonds are pure carbon. So in theory, maybe, right? Maybe. It's pretty hard for them to do, but it might be possible. Any other questions? Yeah. If you took coal and scratched on a sidewalk, would it leave a mark? Probably, because it would leave powdered, powdered coal, which would probably be black. Last question. That's all right. You can ask me next week. Rocks. Here are some Bitterman, rocks we learned. Vitamin coal. Limestone shell. Sandstone, shale, yeah. <laughs> that's good.